The Quarterly, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Lesson 1, 1st Corinthians 1, God's wisdom unites the weak and the foolish. The two epistles to the Corinthians are among the longest of Paul's letters, written to the important community of Corinth, a city so famous for its licentious lifestyle that it spawned a verb, to Corinthianize, which meant to behave in a morally unbridled manner. Yet in this community, Paul planted a church, made up of scattered Jews and formerly idolatrous Gentiles, who desperately needed his guidance as to how they should live and think in that particular context. The first letter to the Corinthians covers the primary topics of wisdom, sexual immorality, greed, and idolatry. Yet it is not simply an impassioned plea to embrace wisdom and flee from these sins. It is also a positive exposition of what the healthy and mature Christian life looks like. As such, it addresses Christian believers in every age and culture, encouraging and challenging them to live wisely for Christ wherever they find themselves. As the modern West increasingly descends into a celebration of Corinthianizing in all its forms, the message of this letter is all the more timely. We need to heed the godly wisdom with which it confronts us. All of Paul's letters begin with a greeting, following a format that was familiar from the wider Greek world, but it's worth paying attention to the details. In his warm letter to the Philippians, Paul introduced himself and Timothy as servants or slaves of Jesus Christ, introducing the theme of humility that he expounds later in his letter. In letters where his primary focus is on correcting aberrant theology, however, such as Colossians and his letters to the Corinthians, Paul introduces himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, compare with Colossians 1.1. 1, 1. This title stresses Paul's authority to teach them what is and what is not orthodox Christian doctrine. Paul also adds, that he was not self-appointed to that role or hired for it by any individual or committee, but was called to it by the will of God. 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Again, also Colossians 1.1. 1, 1. In contrast to Paul's authoritative apostolic office, his co-worker Sosthenes is merely introduced as our brother. In a letter addressed to a church that was mired in all kinds of sin, including a man in a sexual relationship with his father's wife, 1 Corinthians 5.1, it's striking that Paul addresses them as those sanctified in Christ and those called to be saints, verse 2. These two phrases address two distinct aspects of the Christian life, definitive sanctification and progressive sanctification. All those who are truly believers however weak and struggling in their Christian walk, are sanctified in Christ. That is, by virtue of their union with Christ through simple faith, they are fully righteous and holy in God's sight, on the basis of the righteousness of Christ that has been imputed to them. On the other hand, this holiness is the beginning, not the end of the Christian walk. Alongside our definitive status as holy in Christ, we are called to press on in pursuing greater holiness in our daily lives. See Philippians 3, 12 to 14. Both of these perspectives on sanctification are vitally important. Our definitive sanctification is the source of our assurance, on our worst days, as well as on our best, that God will not reject us on the last day. Not because we have attained a minimum level of godliness, but because we're in Christ, whose perfect holiness perfectly satisfies God's righteous requirement. Yet we're not to become lazy on that account, or forget the goal for which Christ purchased us, which is that we should become holy and blameless in his sight. Ephesians 1.4 We have been bought with the blood of Christ, 
So we must make every effort to strive towards God's goal of our holiness, even though we know we will only make small beginnings along that path during our lifetimes, as the Heidelberg Catechism reminds us in question and answer 114. Paul also usually begins his letter by giving thanks for the recipients. The obvious exception being his stinging rebuke of the Galatians in Galatians 1, 5 through 9. And he does so here as well in 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 9. Again, it's worth noticing what Paul specifically thanks God for. In the case of the Corinthians, it is their spiritual giftedness, especially their gifts of speech and knowledge, a topic that he will address in more detail as the epistle unfolds. Yet he immediately refocuses their attention away from their spiritual gifts, blessing though those are, onto Jesus Christ, for whose return from heaven they are waiting. It is Jesus in whom they received those spiritual gifts. It is Jesus who will sustain them until that day, and Jesus in whom they will be presented as guiltless on that day, and Jesus to whom that day belongs. Verse 8. It is into his fellowship that God has called the Corinthians as an expression of God's faithfulness to his own promises. Verse 9. By the fellowship of his son, Paul does not simply mean that as individuals we are now friends of Jesus. Rather, all of us together in the church share a mutual participation in Christ. If the church is together, the fellowship of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, verse 9, how can we tear it into different factions and parties? Yet that's exactly what was happening in Corinth. They were splitting the church on the basis of their preferred leaders, with one claiming to follow Paul, another Apollos, another Cephas, that is Peter, while another claimed to rise above the fray by simply following Christ, verse 12. And such divisions were, for Paul, unthinkable, because they suggested a division in Christ himself, elevating human leaders into a position that belonged to Jesus alone. The uniqueness of Christ is expressed in two distinctives. Jesus was crucified for them, not these human leaders, and they were baptized into the name of Jesus, not that of the leaders of the various factions. That is, what should have united them was their common redemption through the blood of Christ and their common union with Christ's death and resurrection that had been sealed to them in their baptism. Instead, the Corinthians were being divided by their preference for minor differences. It's not as if Peter, Paul and Apollos were preaching a different gospel from one another or even administering a different baptism. Verse 13. In fact, it's unlikely that Peter and Apollos were actively involved in these divisions, in which their purported supporters had magnified differences of emphasis into major distinctions. In the process, they were in danger of emptying the cross of Christ of its power and emphasizing in its place mere human wisdom. Verse 17. The Corinthians seem to have been very enamored with wisdom as were many in Greek culture, verse 22. They wanted to be able to class themselves as the recipients of a unique spiritual knowledge that marked them out from the unenlightened masses, just as the ancient mystery religions promised their devotees. But Paul insists that Christianity is radically different from these religions, in that it is not based on claims of superior knowledge or wisdom, but rather on the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross was a stumbling block to Jews and Gentiles alike, verse 23. To the Jews, anyone who had been hung on a tree was under the curse of God, and so could hardly be the promised Messiah, see Deuteronomy 21, 23. While the Gentiles saw dying on the cross as evidence of a lack of wisdom and power, a wise person would never have put themselves in that situation. Yet Paul calls the cross a demonstration of God's wisdom and power, which are the opposite of human wisdom and power, verses 24 to 25. In the end, God's foolishness, 
which formed the heart of Paul's preaching, verse 21, was wiser and more powerful than so-called human wisdom and strength, verse 25. One evidence of the power of God's faith foolishness lay in the Corinthians themselves. Most of them were not particularly wise or powerful or high-born by human standards, verse 26. Yet God had chosen them, the foolish and the weak, as a demonstration of his wisdom and power. The result of that choice was that none of the Corinthians would be able to boast in God's presence, because they brought nothing to God to motivate him to choose them. On the contrary, God had chosen them because of what they lacked, not because of what they possessed. And he had provided them with everything that was necessary for their salvation in Jesus Christ. All their wisdom, righteousness, holiness, and redemption came from him. Verse 30. As a result, instead of boasting in themselves or boasting in their little factions, they should boast in the Lord and his gift to them in Christ, which united all the Christians in Corinth together as one in him. Application questions. 1. Why is it important to think of other Christians as saints? How does that change the way you look at them? 2. There are many divisions in the contemporary church. Which ones should we repent of and try to overcome? And which ones might be necessary? 3. How is the death and resurrection of Christ a stumbling block to your non-Christian friends and neighbours? 4. What are you and your circle of Christians tempted to boast in? Why is the gospel a much better thing for you to boast in?